Hello everyone, welcome again. So today's topic will be the energy module of Year 11 Chemistry. And in particular, we'll be talking about activation energy and combustion. Um, for people that are new to these lessons, combustion is sort of my area of study now. So hopefully I'll be able to give you a lot of practical things as well as all the theory for chemistry. So you can sort of see where it all fits in the grand scheme of society as well as the theory of chemistry. Okay, so today's lesson is focusing on activation energy. So all reactions require some kind of input, right? You need to start it somehow. Just like when you have a car, if you are driving, um, you need to start it um, with a battery. So reactions need like a kickstart just to get things going. And then once that happens, um, we can keep going from there. So we'll go through a bit in a bit more detail what all this means. So spontaneity is the first thing that we have to talk about. So spontaneous reactions. If you consider a combustion reaction, so a flame of some description, um, the requirements that you need are just a fuel, an oxidant, and some kind of spark, right? So some way of starting that reaction. You may not necessarily need a spark, and we'll go through later how that works, but these are the general three things that you need. Um, and these reactions release a lot of energy, because we can feel the heat from, or the energy from heat um, from, the, from a flame. We can see the light, and it sometimes crackles and things like that. So you can, you can actually feel the energy. Uh, but the question then becomes, why doesn't it happen spontaneously? I mean, if you have such a big release of energy, why doesn't it just go um, when you have oxidant and fuel? Okay? And that's where we're getting to what we call, to call activation energy. So in order to get a reaction to start, you need to start breaking the bonds, the initial bonds in the chemicals. So we talked about bonding a lot in a couple of other lessons. So what we have is we've got chemicals that are bonded together in a certain way, so fuel and oxidant. And in order to get a reaction to happen, we need to start breaking those bonds so that you've got some free atoms, and then letting them rearrange themselves. Um, and in that rearrangement process, they release energy. So we need to have enough energy at the start to start breaking those bonds, otherwise we don't get any reaction. Which is why that if you just leave a f like petrol sitting in air, it doesn't just catch on fire spontaneously. So only when the new bonds are formed, the energy is released. And that energy release goes on to break more bonds, and that helps the, re the reaction to keep going or to sustain itself. Okay? So when you break the bonds, and then the atoms are now by themselves, they readjust and they combine together again in different ways, they release energy. And that energy goes and breaks more bonds in other molecules, and then the same process keeps happening, and it's sort of like a chain reaction. So activation energy, we've just talked about what spontaneity was, and we're trying to build up why things are not spontaneous. And so now we're moving to the concept of activation energy to try and explain why when you have this really enormous heat release from this fuel, it doesn't just happen just because it's, it doesn't just happen randomly. Um, so this is how we explain it. So if you look here, Basically, all, en all reactions require some energy to start at some point. You need some energy. So here you've got a cigarette lighter right at the bottom there. You can't really see it, but it's in a guy's hand. And all of these sparks are used to try and ignite the fuel that comes out of the little hole. So the, the goal is to try and get these sparks to, to ignite the fuel, and these sparks give the fuel and air the energy that they need to start the reaction. Okay. So the energy that is required to start reactions is called the activation energy, as I kind of alluded to earlier. And the formal definition is the minimum energy required to start a chemical reaction. Okay, so sort of the formal definition is just how much, just the minimum energy that we need just for a reaction to start, and then it will become self-sustaining after that. Okay. Now, from a physical standpoint, um, so that's the theory part. If you look at it from a physical of like what's actually happening with this activation energy, well, the activation energy is the energy required to break sufficient number of bonds. So you've got like a fuel and an oxidant, like maybe say petrol and air. You've got to break up the petrol into all of its component atoms. So whatever, however many carbon atoms and however many hydrogen atoms. And you've got to break the oxygen atoms, uh, oxygen molecules in the air into oxygen atoms. 
So that requires energy because you're splitting all these chemicals up. So you've got to break a sufficient number, so a certain amount of them, so that when they reform to give out energy, because when bonds form, they give out energy, when they reform, the reaction can become self-sustaining because that energy can then go and break other bonds and those other bonds, uh, those other bonds that were broken will form again with, into new compounds and then that will release energy and that process will be sort of like a chain reaction. Okay? Now from knowing that, how much energy is required to start a reaction, we can sort of tell or predict what an endothermic and exothermic reaction is. So, like, how do we talk about it in terms of activation energy? So for exothermic reactions, the activation energy is very low compared to the energy released by the reaction. So, for instance, when you burn a fuel, the amount of energy it takes to burn to start the fuel is very low compared to the actual heat and energy that you get out. Okay? And that's how we sort of know it's exothermic, because the amount of energy you get out severely outweighs the amount of energy that you had to put in to start it. Okay? And that energy released, a portion of it, so some of that energy that got emitted by the formation of new bonds, goes into breaking more bonds in the fuel and oxidant, um, which allows more energy to be released, which allows the reaction to continue. Okay, so only a portion of it is required to keep that reaction going. Okay? Now for endothermic reactions, so these will absorb energy, the activation energy is high because the energy released by the formation of new bonds is very low. So when you break up the chemicals in an endothermic process and then put them back together in a new way, those, that new formation of compounds, the energy released from that is very low. So it doesn't have enough energy to continue breaking bonds, so you have to constantly put energy in. So here it is. Continual input of energy is required to achieve complete reaction or a reaction at all. So if you think about something like, uh, for instance, say, electrolysizing water, so electrolyzing water, you're trying to split the water atoms into hydrogen and oxygen. But the problem is that you have to continually pump electricity into it for that to happen. And that's why it's an endothermic process. Okay? Now, interpreting the value of activation energy. So large values for activation energy imply that the bonds formed by the reaction emit less energy than the energy required to break those bonds. So in other words, for activation, large values of activation energy, the strength of the bonds of the reactants is much higher than the strength of the bonds of the products. So water has a very high bond strength. It's very, very stable. But hydrogen and oxygen gas are much less stable. So that's why the activation energy for that reaction, for water to hydrogen and oxygen, is very, very high. Okay? So you can think of it sort of as like pushing this boulder up a hill. Okay? Eventually, you'll get to the top of the hill and then it'll fall down and then everything will happen. But if the hill is too big, you have to put in a lot of energy just to get the top for the reaction to happen. Um, if the hill is really small or if it's flat, I could just roll this boulder along and it'll fall straight down and it'll be very easy. So you can think of activation energy as sort of the amount of effort you have to put in for a reaction to occur. Okay? So i.e. in this case, it's endothermic. So low values imply the converse, and thus exothermic reactions. So if you have a very low value, um, it'll be really easy to push the boulder over the hill, which is good. Um, but what it means is that the bond strength of the reactants, in, an, in this case, is really, really low compared to the bond strength of the products. Or the reactants are less stable than the, the products. So in this case, if you were to burn the hydrogen and oxygen, you would get water. And you can see that that gives off heat. Um, the Hindenburg is one of the big examples when hydrogen got burnt. Um, it gives off a lot of heat and energy and light, um, and you get a very stable product out, which is water. So that's what we talk about in terms of exothermic reactions. 
Now, activation energy can also be used as a measure of stability or stored chemical energy. Okay, so stability, if you have a very big activation energy, you're very, very stable because you don't want to break up into other compounds. If you have very low activation energy, then you have a very unstable chemical because you want to break down into more stable compounds. Um, in terms of chemical energy, if you, want, if you have a high activation energy, so it, you take in a lot of energy, it means you have very low chemical energy because you needed to take in a lot of energy for stuff to happen. Whereas the opposite will happen if you have very high chemical energy. If you have high chemical energy, your activation energy will be really low because as soon as something happens, you can sort of release all your chemical energy and then break down into more stable products. Okay? So we've covered in sort of the theory of what activation energy is. Um, so we talked about how to interpret the size of activation energy and actually what activation energy is in terms of spontaneous reactions and non-spontaneous reactions. So we'll move on to the question segment and hopefully you'll see how all of this activation energy applies to real life. So why don't many reactions happen spontaneously? Answer with regard to bonding and energy. Well, for a reaction to occur, bonds need to be broken and then new ones need to be formed. Okay? So that's what a reaction is. Bonds being broken and then reformed. Okay? So in order to break bonds, energy needs to be supplied to the system. So you, in order to get that first part, the bonds breaking part, you need to put energy into the system first. And so for spontaneous reactions, there must be sufficient energy available from the environment to initiate the bond breaking process. So if you want a spontaneous reaction to occur, so something just to happen in, if you just left it there, you have to have enough energy in the ambient environment to make that reaction happen. And often that's not the case. Um, some reactions actually is, that does happen, but many times it's not. So you've got to have enough energy in the outside or available to this chemical in order for you to break enough bonds to get that reaction going. Now often this environmental energy is not sufficient. Okay. So moving on, question two. A fuel which was left to mix with air at room temperature spontaneously ignited. Why did this happen? Okay, so now we're talking, I just said that it doesn't always happen, but sometimes it might. So here's the case of when it might. So the temperature of the room was sufficient to initiate the reaction. Okay, so that's a case of actual, a real life situation where you have enough fuel and air and the temperature is high enough that the fuel actually ignited. So the event, energy available to the chemical system uh, via heat transfer, so the temperature of the air, was sufficient to start the reaction between the fuel and oxidant. Okay? So the fuel and oxidant mixed, the temperature was high enough to actually get that reaction, those bonds breaking, and then you got ig ignition of the fuel. Okay? So that's what we're, that's one of the cases where ignition or spontaneous reactions can occur. Question three. In terms of stability and bond strength, describe what a low activation energy indicates. So if you have a low activation energy, what does it tell you about stability of that chemicals and bond strength of those chemicals? Well, a low, react a low activation energy implies that reactants are not stable or have a large amount of energy stored as chemical energy. So it's either they're, very not, they're not stable at all and they have a very large amount of stored energy. When this energy is released, it can break more bonds, sustaining their reaction. Okay? The bond strength of these reactants is also low, as they are easily broken by small amounts of energy. So we can say that the bond strength is low because the, active, the amount of energy it takes to break them is very little. And we can say the chemical energy is very high because they emit a lot of energy. And also, the stability is low because it takes really only a little bit of energy to break up those bonds. Okay. Question four. So carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and pollutant. So this is something I study as well, um, how to deal with this. Using energy, it is possible to split it up into C and O, so carbon and oxygen. Explain in terms of stability and activation energy why this doesn't happen. So why don't we do this? Like, I mean, we are really worried about this carbon dioxide. So why don't we just put in some energy and get back to carbon solid and oxygen gas. Okay? 
Well, from our experience with carbon dioxide, we know it's very, very stable. It's extremely stable. Okay? Therefore, because it's so stable, we don't want it to change form. And by stable, I mean it doesn't react with anything. And if you think about it, we use carbon dioxide in fire extinguishers simply because it doesn't react. So therefore, it doesn't want to change forms. So in order to force this change, a large amount of energy, the activation energy, is required. So in order to force it to change form, we need to put in a lot of energy. And this energy requirement is prohibitive, and thus this process is not sustainable. So we've got all this carbon dioxide, but we need to put in so much energy that, we need, that it's just not, not going to happen. Um, and even if we could put in that much energy, where does all our energy come from? Fossil fuels. So we're just putting in more carbon dioxide. So it's just this big loop, big feedback loop, which is bad. Okay, so hopefully you can see how not feasible this is. So moving on, question five. Explain why petrol cars require a spark plug. And, I, and in future lessons, we'll talk about how a petrol car varies from a diesel car, um, if you don't know. But why do we need a spark plug? Well, cars rely on the conversion of chemical energy in the fuel to mechanical energy. So they take fuel, which has got chemical energy, and convert it into mechanical energy, which is you know, the moving of the car. right? So that's the energy conversion step. So in order to convert this energy, combustion occurs in the cylinder. So there's, like a, there's a couple of cylinders in your car, and it, you explode the gas, essentially, and it pushes on a piston, and then that causes motion. Okay? So in order to start this combustion reaction, a source of energy is required to meet the activation energy, and that's why we need a spark. So in other words, a spark plug just gives you just enough energy to start the combustion process, and then um, from then on, the, the combustion will happen, it will give you that motion, and then you'll have to do it all over again. So we need that spark plug just to get the combustion starting. Okay? So that concludes today's lesson on activation energy. We covered the concept of activation energy and how to interpret it chemically in the physical and in the physical sense as well. And then we also covered how it relates to endo and exothermic reactions. So in future lessons, we'll talk about more combustion-oriented um, topics, like engine design and things like that. So I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson. Mm -hmm.